Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session of Catalyst Magazine Live. My name is Joe Mitchell and I'm the STEM Enrichment Coordinator at STEM Learning. Our guest today is Ted Dubowski, Honorary General Secretary of the Geologists Association. Ted is exploring satellite data to map the surface features of North Africa in a personal research project. Ted, welcome to Catalyst Magazine Live. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, teams. Before I introduce myself, I'd like to introduce the topic. As the title has an explicit and relevant message to you all. I would also like to make it clear that I would like you to seriously consider earth science as a profession. Now, if you think science isn't your cup of tea, still just hear me out. The message you need to know from the title is literacy. It's about how you express yourself. Personally, I found that the best way to learn is when you consider everything as a story, even your life. You're in control of your future story by what you do now to learn in order to create how your story will play out. The greater the literacy you develop, the greater and better way you'll get to write and improve your story. Now, in this way of thinking, you learn to know and understand different subjects by using a language specific to the needs of what you are trying to learn in order to express yourself accurately. You just need to learn that language and gain the experience so you can confidently express yourself in many different ways with different subject matter. But it takes time. It's not rocket science. It's about effort, practice, persistence and patience. It's also an openness and flexibility to learn to do something new and see things from different directions and dimensions. School is just one way you learn, but it's actually not enough. What else do you personally do to extend your own life's wider literacy skills? To start, I would like you to think about this image of Africa. The six thoughts provided for you are just a few of the topics I have got to think about in my research. As you follow along in this webinar, maybe there are questions that you might be asking yourself. Those questions are what research is all about. Your interest in finding out about something. <clears throat> My interest is about the huge expanse of North Africa, the large brown area, which we call the Sahara. Now, 250 million years ago, the earth didn't look like this. There was a supercontinent called Gondwana. By about 80 to 90 million years ago, it was breaking apart. You may have heard about the theory of plate tectonics in your geography. That's how Gondwana broke apart. Huge ruptures, cracks and breaks, such as we see in the mid-ocean ridges and the Rift Valley of East Africa and the formation of the Red Sea. Europe, on the other hand, was part of another supercontinent called Laurasia. Between them was a large body of water called the Tethys Sea. The last remaining parts of Tethys are the Mediterranean, Black, Caspian and Aral Seas. Different parts of Gondwana moved apart in different directions and either crashed into Asia, such as India, or is currently in the process of crashing together, such as Europe and Africa. It's this process of the crashing of Africa into Europe 
that makes the landscapes and landforms of North Africa that so much interesting. This pro project is not a traditional science investigation in which you're trying to solve a problem. And this is what you do and are taught at in schools. This research is an exploration, more in the way of the old fashioned explorers, such as Herodotus, Marco Polo, Captain James Cook, Charles Darwin. You may or may not have heard of them, but it's done in the comfort of my own home using a computer. Now that's pretty weird comparing myself to uh, the old explorers, isn't it? Well, I'm planning on using satellite data to explore the landscape and landforms of North Africa to help understand how the Sahara was developed through this crashing of the, of the continents and to consider where all the water that sculpted this area came from and went to. Certainly, we know that a lot of rocks in the Sahara are known to have formed in water, that is, in the Teddy Sea, or were deposited by rivers that flowed into the sea. Which is why the investigation and mapping of paleo drainage systems, which are geologically old drainage networks, is an important and key aspect to this investigation. So the first takeaway, water played an important role in forming the landforms and landscapes of North Africa. What's the story of one grain of sand you could just pick up anywhere in the Sahara? The brief storylines on the slides, now they might seem a little bit corny and silly. And this is the point I'm making about literacy. Specifically, literacy means you are required to learn the language of a subject. To research with literacy is to read, write, rewrite, edit, reread, read, and rewrite more. You apply literacy to write your story based on what you are seeing and what you have read. The story you write is your expression of the research, and that becomes a part of your own life story. Now, importantly, the internet doesn't have the answers to your question. You need other resources. You do the research and you add to the story of the subject you are investigating. Now, you might think by now it's too much work and not for you. Students, unfortunately, usually do. Now, I've been there and I've had to change the story of my life to get to write this one. Now, let me explain this so you can see where I've come from and what has prompted me to personally do this exploration of North Africa. This project is the high point of my story. From when I did my high school certificate, which is sixth form in Australia. How did I get to write my story to involve myself in such a research project? Well, a very short version of my background is I was born in England. My parents migrated with me and my family to Australia in 1965. They called that the 10 pound passage. And I grew up and edu was educated in Australia. And that's where I became a geologist. But that was the big change to my story. Because you see, I wanted to study German history at university. Science, in fact, was my weakest and my worst subject. Now, another big change was here in England. I had to change careers as I had no job. In my family situation, I had issues there. So I became a teacher in 1998 and I retired in August 2020. 
you might be asking, how do you get to university and become a scientist, especially if you have low grades? and to get to study a subject that you didn't like or had no interest in. So I know exactly what it's like not to get what you want to really do. The middle scores are my exam results. You change, which is about the major effort the positive attitude and hard work you put into your education. Take making mistakes as the greatest learning experiences and achievements you can ever have, as that is what real learning is about. Only you can make the choices to put effort into your learning and education so you can write your story which hopefully will be a great one. Now, I did pass my high school certificate, but not strongly. Now, Wollongong University was just starting. It had just been granted university status. It was small, compact, but it was a pretty little place. Now, applying openness and flexible thinking to my life, geology is history. It's the history of this big and beautiful planet we live on. So I've still managed to do history, even though it's from a different perspective. So the second takeaway, never write yourself off to do science. You are more capable than you may believe. Hence your work putting that extra effort into becoming brilliant on any path you choose. Make sure you talk things out with your family, friends and teachers. Also, research university courses local to you that you can do what interests you, even to the extent of going and talking to lecturers and department heads. Now, I was encouraged by my family to do that, even though I was reluctant, and I'm glad I did. Geology is a science, or how I believe and think about it, it's the foundation of all sciences. Now, science is a story. It's about how we humans make sense of this world we live on. And we need to express ourselves to describe what we see and how we think something is and how it works. In simple terms, we ask questions and try to find an answer. That's applied research. Now I'm here to encourage you to consider being a scientist through becoming an earth scientist, a geologist, by informing you of my research. There is a foundational field of science and it's one about the world we live on, earth science and the systems on and around it that make it work. Think about this, without the planets and the stars, in other words, the rocks, minerals and gases that make them up, there'd be no gravity so no physics to study. There'd be no biosystems to develop on the planets and there'd be no chemicals to study. Again, you need to learn to have openness and flexibility of mind. It helps you to think differently. So the third takeaway, how concerned are you about this world you live on? What can you do to help? Do you want to help? Earth science is the literal rock solid foundation you need. With the advent of satellite data in helping you with visualizing the earth, its makeup and environments, this has become an exciting time to get into becoming an earth scientist. 
As I found out throughout my life, luck is taking the advantage of the opportunities that present themselves to you. It's how I essentially got into working with satellite data. An opportunity came and I took it, even though I knew nothing about it. And I did find it extremely difficult to comprehend to begin with. And it began like this. It began in South Australia, in a place somewhat like a Hulbert Hole in a more or less pantry sized room. Well, actually, a small space, two metres by one metre, in a big office, but without the food. I was planning and organising my projects about the geology and landforms in mineral investigations and studying and interpreting aerial photographs, which is a part of the geologist's skill set. Eventually, we purchased huge prints of Landsat multispectral scanner data which provided a bird's eye view of much larger areas than an aerial photograph and gave you a better perspective of what you were looking at. For one project, the critical one for me and my future interest, was one showing the big bend of the Murray River in South Australia, shown in this image, and the relics and scars of old drainage systems, river channels, and channel scarps that were visible to show the migration of the Murray River towards the east to the right of the image. Once I started training on computer systems, I was able to process different data sets, Landsat 5 thematic mapper satellite data and the NOAA weather satellite data set. As I was learning, I also experimented with ideas that all of a sudden came to me and from which I created this image. My mentor and I were both gobsmacked as it showed something totally unexpected. A large paleo drainage system covering the western half of South Australia. In the geological story here, the paleo drainage aspect was hinted at. This was the first time it was made visible. And that's that big red north to south trending side of the image that you see there on the left hand side. Now I didn't pursue this project. However, I collaborated with the Australian Federal Government's Department Bureau, Bureau of Mineral Resources on some other work. I showed my collaborative colleague this image. His jaw dropped as well. Now I was back in England being a teacher and this was around 2007 when I found information on the internet that the BMR had produced a map somewhere I think in around 2000, 2001, of a significant paleo drainage system. I was ecstatically happy because I knew where this map came from. This work on paleo drainage systems always stayed with me. So when it came to thinking about what to do in retirement with my geology and my remote sensing background, the project idea was already germinating in my brain. In my research project, I'm trying to put stories together that will help explain what I see in the landscapes and landforms of the Sahara, shown on this image. I've shared with you the beginnings of how I got to do this type of work. And now, I'll share and explain some of the details I need to consider to start writing this story. Everything is about the minor details you observe and see. Computer processing cannot do the job of picking out the details and linking it to ideas that a person can. There are way too many variables, too many ideas, some not yet thought of, 
that will have to be considered. This is why the project is based on observation, analysis, and interpretation by a human being, me. Hence, it's why this project is more of an exploration rather than a problem solving exercise. To write the story of the landscape requires a process. The first of the processes is a map. You need to have a base map. This map needs to be a topographic map and producing one by conventional means, especially of an area the size of the Sahara is no mean feat. This topographic map of Siwa Oasis in the Western Desert, Desert of Egypt was put together by the US Army from 1940s data. For analyzing and interpreting the map, it still comes down to asking yourself a lot of questions. What do I see? What's the topography of the land? Where is the water coming from? I was intrigued by very low, but very long length scarps, low vertical cliff faces that were a major feature of a lot of, a lot of the maps in the Western Egyptian desert. Out of historical interest, these two topographic maps of the Nile Valley have completely changed. This section of the Nile River is now Lake Nasa, created by the Aswan High Dam. With satellites and airborne systems, we can now create digital topographic maps. And it's how I create my base maps. I use data obtained from the Shuttle Radar Topographic Mapping Mission, which was completed over 11 days in February 2000. I create my own topographic base maps called dig Digital Elevation Models by downloading the data tiles I need. The area of co coverage of the data tiles I've downloaded are shown by this image. Radar data helps in topographic landscape mapping because it has an element of penetration into the subsurface, especially useful in desert environments. This is what coverage of an area looks like with the tiles. It's a mosaic, a patchwork quilt. However, you need the mosaic to be seamless and even which is the first process you've got to do. You also use other processing techniques to complete the DEM. A hill shade filter, which highlights the landscape through the texture, that is the surface graininess, the roughness and the smoothness, and the linear and curvy linear physical and geological structures that make up the landscape. Topography. Colorizing then helps show topography of a similar height. This image helps to show the gradient of the Nile River towards the sea, as well as the nature of the Nile Delta. But just remind yourself all you are seeing is a topography made up of radar data obtained from the space shuttle. This is the DM, DEM of my full study area after processing the tiles, 2,363 of them to make up the seamless mosaic. This is the seamless mosaic after it's been processed with a hillshade fil filter to highlight the landscape features. When you've got what you think is a good base, then you can start to read the map to create the stories of what you think you are seeing by annotating the map. 
Any ideas you have will change as you analyze and interpret the features in greater details. This is where the why of the literacy skill set required to be learnt, developed and understood is really needed. For this project, I focus my research on scarps, paleo drainage and the landforms and landscapes. I process the DEM to highlight the low scarps, five to 10 meters high. Why not the paleo drainage systems directly? Because they are often eroded la landform features and topographically very low and have long and low topographic gradients or slopes. You therefore look for something that could suggest a drainage feature, such as a scarp, which is an erosion feature, as well as a structural geological feature that can influence the course of a river or form a basin to create a lake. Scarps are erosional features. The Sahara is littered with drainage networks, but not all scarps are formed by river drainage net networks. Just look at the differences in the three images. The answer I'm seeking lies in another erosive feature. Scarps caused by erosion at or below sea level, such as on the continental shelf and the slope region but having to find evidence to support this idea in the DEM. Now this is work that is still in progress. Looking widely over the DEM I've created, the Richtat structure in Mauritania, the I in the left image, and the Abu Tatoa Plateau in Egypt, or for some reason, as I like to call it, the Godzilla Plateau, are topographic features develop, developed by ridge and scarp forming processes. You might be able to guess why I call it Godzilla. So taking time and looking around the DEM can often provide literal pictures in a landscape from a certain point of view. Anyway, this is a really important step to do, as you've really got to get to know the physical landscape. It's called reconnaissance. Through this reconnaissance, I'm questioning if the Nile is the longest river in the world. Now I'm stating this because there is a part of the Nile River that needs to be looked at more closely and with a consideration of what is going on around it. The Nile is regarded as the longest river in the world. We know that it has two distinct gradients, a steep slope coming down out of the mountains and a suddenly shallower slope from the region called the Sud in Sudan to the Mediterranean Sea. Now you can see on the graph and the map the difference, where all of a sudden the Nile has one main channel course. It's a bit of a jingle theme here, isn't there? Suddenly the Sud in Sudan. When you look at where the Nile starts, its low gradient journey, how can we be sure it's one and the same river? or if it really is the longest river in the world. The Sud is basically low ground, boggy wetlands, surrounded by high mountains with streams and rivers that drain into this area. The Sud Basin borders the East African Rift Valley on its eastern edge, the right-hand side, which is a very active rift. In other words, it's a splitting of the African continent, which causes uplift, subsidence and volcanic activity. To the northwest of the Sud 
is the Tibesti region, a volcanic region which does affect the ground, generally as uplift, because of the heat rising up from the lower regions of the earth. Because of the active geological features in this region, there, these are the important issues to think about when considering the Nile River in the region of the Sud. Let's see what my digital topographic map shows. Let's just go back to this DEM of North Africa that I've annotated. I'm suggesting that the mountains to the south of the Sud and Chad basins may have been part of a former coastline with a previous and older river system that came down into the Sud, which flowed along this coastline and drained into the Chad Basin. If you look at the triangular shape of the Chad Basin, could it possibly have been a delta? This is what I'll be looking at as part of this investigation. Looking more closely at the regions between the Chad and the Sud, the beauty of computer technology is that you can add other data sets. If you look at the Sud region now, you'll notice that there is a more visual definition of the drainage. These, in fact, are mapped floodwaters from October 2021. Notice that the floodwaters trend is more towards the northwest or the yellow axis of the Sud, whilst the Nile River trend is more to the north or the blue axis. This type of observation is important because it possibly indicates a previous river direction. The Sud showing more clearly the October 2021 flooding and the distinct channels. You may have noticed that there is a pronounced west to east line of floodwaters towards the known Nile River channel. This suggests that the course of the drainage channel is influenced by some form of geological structure, maybe a fault line. This in turn suggests that the Nile River here may be developing as a river capture channel. And this does beg the question, will the capture system develop fully and remain intact? Or will continuing tectonic and volcanic uplift cause this region to close and maybe even dry up, up, hence cutting off a significant portion of the Nile River. That's what we need to think about for the communities that live in this region who rely on the water in the Sud. Looking closely again at the connecting channel, it appears to be more defined. Look at the texture and shape of the material between the Sud and Chad Basin, where you can now see that distinct channel. What I mean by texture is the coarser grainy appearance compared to the finer appearance of the material you see in the Sud and Chad Basins. Also remember that I said, being radar data, you do get a bit of penetration into the ground possibly why the texture is enhanced. These are some of the physical features that DEMs, when processed, can help you to interpret and understand the landscape better than a paper map can. What are my thoughts about what I'm seeing? Given the geology of the area, a region that was an active volcano, possibly dormant now, the channel does look as though it existed, but by either land slippage, such as an avalanche, or maybe even a volcanic eruption or an ash flow, possibly caused by block, possibly caused the blockage to the channel. Also, further heat rising from below the Tibesti volcano region when it was active and heating the ground, 
could have started a process of tilting the land toward the east. The floodwaters definitely seem to want to go that direction. The formation of the East African Rift, starting about 30 million years ago, complicates the picture, but was possibly responsible for the development of a northerly flowing river basin that eventually became the Nile. This is to be continued in my investigation. To finish off this webinar, given the need of water in North Africa, this is a reason we need students like yourself studying earth sciences. Working with this type of data from different angles and perspectives is very demanding, but extremely rewarding. And it helps you to learn more about the nature and beauty of this world we live on. It is reasonable to suggest that the soot could literally close and dry up not because of climate change, but because of regionally active tectonic and volcanic activity. So we have got to look at the bigger picture in North Africa. Not everything that happens will be attributed to climate change. There are other more profound forces active in this part of the world. Africa and Europe are crashing into each other. Think of the recent earthquake in Turkey as evidence for this. Also think about this. Is the aridity of the Sahara purely down to climate? Or is it down to geological forces changing the landscape and its topography, which in turn affects the climate? You yourselves can go on to explore these and other questions, which is why I'm actively encouraging you to think about becoming an earth scientist. I may not have wanted to be a science person, but I've come to love being a geologist. The next 10 years or so, I will be looking <coughs> at all the landscape that now forms the Sahara. How did the crashing of Africa into Europe affect landscape development? This is one of the questions I'm looking to answer. So thank you for your time in listening. I certainly hope that you students think differently about science. Satellite technology has opened up new frontiers needing a new type of explorer. You can become that explorer. Earth science is a really worthwhile career pursuing. Good luck and best wishes, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ted. Thank you. I delighted that we can now switch through to our question and answers so I hope you're ready for this so firstly what is the most exciting aspects of your job that's not an easy one to answer because when you be when you're a geologist you get to be out there in the open living camping under the stars looking at this landscape that we an environment that we live in it's getting to know something about this world we live on, but it's knowing that with what you do, you can influence the lives of other people and other communities and just be part of something brilliant. <laughs> okay. Not easy to explain. That's OK. And following on from that question, we have can you explain a bit more about earth science? It's such a wide subject. How did you decide which branch to specialize in? Uh, again, not easy. You are correct. Earth science is a combination of many, many specific subjects that encompass different 
areas, but also cross over into other areas. When I started, my first job, which I didn't take up, was going to be what's called a geophysicist. It didn't appeal to me. I ended up getting a job as a mineral resource geologist working for a company that produced bricks, specifically bricks for manu manufacturing for the big industrial furnaces, the blast furnaces. So we call them refractory bricks. So I started my job in minerals. I got a second job in mineral exploration. And then I managed to get my job in the South Australian Department of Mines and Energy, where I spent 10 years of my life as a mineral resource geologist. So that's where I got into geology. And it was through my work as a mineral resource geologist that I, you know, with photogeology, getting into learning how to work with air photographs and then Landsat photography, it stimulated me. I wanted to get a little bit know more about what's this thing called remote sensing technology. I sort of got involved in a few things happening at work. And through that, I actually sort of pushed into, you know, we need to explore it more. And with that, work sort of said, okay, you can sort of become the lead project person in how our organization can use remote sensing technology in mineral investigations. And so I ended up uh, doing that, getting involved in a lot of training. And it's been with me ever since. I've really loved working with satellite data. So again, that's the best I can answer at this point in time. Awesome. I need hours to talk to about. <laughs> well, we do know that uh, one of our listeners um, is very interested in studying geography as a degree with an interest in geology. But as they're stating, there is so much choice, it's hard to narrow it down. So do you have one top tip you could provide? Ooh. Research what earth science is, see what really fascinates you, which areas, what is it you'd really like to achieve? and take it from there. But do talk to the universities about the earth science that they study. Now get their spin on it, see how they influence and help you uh, to sort of feel, oh, that sounds really great. That's what happened to me. You know, I was unsure because science was awful for me as a student. You know, I was encouraged to go to my local university, Wollongong, talk to somebody. The vocational people there put me in touch with the geology department. And it was with the help and guidance of the assistant head of department who sat with me for a couple of hours and literally mapped with me what I can do over the three years of my degree. There are people like that in the universities. You need to tap into uh, them. They're very helpful. Thank you. Do you consider that the SUD and CHAD could combine? Uh, could they combine? It's more likely that uh, they used to be, but because of the formation of the volcanic region, that's part of the geology story of why they're probably not con not really connected that well anymore. And again, as I said, that's part of what I'll be investigating. Who knows what will happen in a few hundred thousand years or a million years time. The more study we do, the more we might likely find out. And our next question is, what can we do to prevent 
the damage to the Sahara? Is is there anything that we can do? Uh, let me answer one question with another. Are you suggesting we have got to try prevent natural earth processes from happening? Think about it that way. Man, can we really affect change of the most profound forces on this earth? Or like a lot of indigenous tribes people, should we live with what is happening around us? I'll leave it to you to think about, about things in that way. He liked the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we've got one more. Does the Sud Delta contain any different soil types? At this point in time, uh, I've, I've only started beginning the work and I'm purely trying to establish a topographic base map. Once I get that all worked out and you know, I'm happy with everything, which I'm nearly there. Then it becomes working with the actual satellite data. And then I've got to try research and try obtain a lot of other um, uh, material that's out there. But I do know from what I've already collected that there's been an awful lot of work done on the soil types of North Africa and especially down this part of the world. So there are maps of the soil types and I think the UN has done some of uh, this work. So eventually that is a really good question because it's something I'm going to have to get hold of and include in my work. So when I sort of use the satellite data to sort of try and map the different va variations in soil types, I can sort of see what has already been done. So yeah, good question. And it's definitely something that's already been on my, my mind and thinking about. And we got one more. One of them is, thank you for considering my question. In school geography lessons, the Nile Delta was considered, and I think that is relating back to the sub delta containing different soil types. Uh, you think what a delta is, um, the delta forms at the end of a river, you know, so it's traveling through an awful lot of country, you know, slowly eroding or when flood waters, it's moving a whole mass of a lot of minerals and different uh, materials in you know in solution and they come from different uh, types of soil backgrounds and so the delta is built up of a lot of different material from a lot of different sort of soil uh, uh, regimes you know throughout the track of the river. Um, again, um, there are maps of the Nile Valley of uh, surface features. I've got those maps and eventually when I start working in that part of the world, I'll be digitizing those maps and again looking at it. But again, you've got to basically think that a delta is the buildup of a wide variety of uh, material from different soil types scattered throughout the profile length of any river system. Uh, there are articles about where some of the sands of the Nile and also of the Saharan sands have come from. I'm still, I've got those research papers and I haven't read them yet. As I said, I can't do the whole story yet. I've got to break everything down into sort of regional works. 
And at this point of time, the regional area I'm sort of considering is the what we call the Sirenica Marmarica platform, which is that big area between the Nile River and the Gulf of Sirte, you know, in Libya. So that's one of the first areas I'm actually starting to focus on because it's trying to get some evidence for the scarp formations. But I take what you're saying and, you know, yes, I've got to, again, be, I will be looking at some of what the research about where some of the materials of the Nile and the Sahara sands have come from. We are drawing to a close, so I'm just going to quickly give you the last couple of messages that have been popped in. One is, I wish my school could bring in a specialist to talk about certain subjects to help with career choices. Ted has a great passion. So absolutely loving your talk. And I am a STEM ambassador and I can be contacted because not only as a STEM ambassador, but as the General Secretary of the Geologist Association, which is uh, volunteer, which is a charitable educational organisation made up of professionals and passionate people from all walks of life interested in geology. You know, contact STEM and try to get me to come in. I'm always willing to. I'm always going to be willing to come in and talk to people. That is brilliant to hear, uh, particularly as we are hoping to set up live in school versions of Catalyst Mag Live so that it'll be very similar to this, but it will be done live in the classroom for various people. So we are going to be looking for some volunteers for that and we're looking for schools to also think about could they host this kind of event for us. It would be absolutely brilliant if we could get that up and running. And one final comment from our listeners. Thank you again for considering this concept. It may be difficult in a supply geography lesson to know exactly how to teach this. <laughs> I agree. I've been there, done that. It's something I wanted to do, but realise when the government's uh, got a fixed, fixed, uh, fixed education system, it's very difficult to sort of change and teach the real science that students really need to know. Thank you, Ted, for such an incredible exploration of your insightful project, Reading the Sahara. It is amazing how much information can be gleaned through satellite data and to see how it can shape our understanding of what has been to what may come. Earth science is a key area of research of increasing importance to our understanding of the world around us. I am sure you will inspire many of our students to consider this as they shape their own futures. Thank you for sharing your research with us. And thank you to our audience for joining us. You can access other Catalyst Magazine live recordings on our YouTube channel with forthcoming events available to book through Eventbrite. So keep checking back for details. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. <laughs>